Welcome to Unit 1 of Bhakti Shastri Online. In Unit 1, we'll be studying Bhagavad Gita as it is, chapters 1 to 6. Translation and commentary by Iskand's founder Archarja, Shala Abhaychar and Adabindu Bhaktivedanta Shami Shri Prabhupada. In the introduction to Bhagavad Gita as it is, Prabhupada has included uh, Sri Adi Sankar Archarja's Gita Mahatmya. Let's chant a few verses from the Gita Mahatmya. Mala Niramo Chanam Pungshang Jalashnanam Dine Dine Sakrit Gitamrita Snanam Shangshara Malanashanam One may cleanse himself daily by taking a bath in water, but if one takes a bath even once in the sacred Ganges water of Bhagavad Gita, for him the dirt of material life is altogether vanquished. Gita Sugita Karta Byakimyan Yashashta Vishtarai Yashwayam Padamanavasham Mukapadma Vinishrita one need only attentively and regularly hear and read Bhagavad Gita. One need not read any other Vedic literature because it is spoken by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Bhagavad Gita is the essence of all Vedic literatures. Sarvo pani shrogabo dogta gopalanandana partavatsa sudhir vokta dugdam gita amritam mahat. The Gita Upanishad, Bhagavad Gita, the essence of all the Upanishads, is just like a cow. And Lord Krishna, who is famous, as a cowherd boy, is milking this cow. Arjuna is just like a calf, and learned scholars and pure devotees are to drink the nectarian milk of Bhagavad Gita. Shriman Bhagavad Gita ki, Srila Prabhupada ki. Let's take a closer look at the preface to Bhagavad Gita as it is. Prabhupada wrote it, this preface in 1971, in May in Sydney, Australia. And in the preface, Prabhupada reveals some very significant points which uh, shed light on his uh, mission, uh, specifically in providing Bhagavad Gita as it is, and his general mission of spreading Krishna consciousness all over the world, and the specific uh, role that Bhagavad Gita plays in that overall mission of Srila Prabhupada. So Prabhupada's explaining that his purpose is to present the will of Krishna as it is, and therefore Prabhupada subtitles his Bhagavad Gita with the subtitle as it is, indicating that as Prabhupada writes on the top of page X1X in the preface, our only purpose is to present Bhagavad Gita as it is in order to guide the conditioned student for the same purpose for which Krishna descends to this planet once in a day. What is what is that purpose? That's very clearly explained by Prabhupada also here in the preface over the page that the highest perfection of life is... Instead of satisfying one's own personal material senses, he has to satisfy the senses of the Lord. That's Krishna consciousness, devotional service to Krishna. And the Lord wants this. He demands this. Mam ekasharana, surrender unto me. One has to understand the central point of Bhagavad Gita. And our Krishna consciousness movement is teaching the central point of the Bhagavad Gita because we're not polluting the theme. So this is very pr predominant uh, component, aspect, angle of Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita as it is, that he's very, very much in alignment with Krishna's original purpose of coming to reclaim the fallen conditioned souls and speaking Bhagavad Gita for that purpose. And Prabhupada is explaining that uh, he's presented Bhagavad Gita particularly in line with this intention of Krishna to induce the uh, forgetful conditioned souls to revive their relationship, loving uh, relationship with Krishna as his eternal servants to authorize the activities of ISKCON. Actually, at the time, in the early 1970s, ISKCON was still a very uh, a new movement, 
and was not uh, known so much in the Western world. It was not even understood as being a very ancient uh, spiritual uh, process. And therefore, the Bhagavad Gita plays such a significant uh, contribution in authorizing the activities of the Krishna consciousness movement based on statements Krishna makes. Satatam kirtayantamam, the devotees are always chanting Krishna's names. Uh, Manmana, they're always thinking of Krishna. Bhava Mad Bhakta Mam Namaskuru, worship me, bow down to me. All of the activities of the Krishna consciousness movement, we see their roots, we can see their authority in the statements that Krishna makes in the Bhagavad Gita. Patram Pushpam Palam Tauyam, Yomi Bhakta Prayachati, you offer me fruits, leaves, flower, water, I will accept it, deity worship. Acharya Bhashanam, accepting a spiritual master. Evam Param Param Prabhtam, I can be received, I can be attained through the parampara system, so many of these important principles of Bhagavad Gita which authorize, which give evidence, the Shastrik evidence to the day-to-day -day activities that we're performing in the Krishna consciousness movement. In this way the book authorizes our activities and as Prabhupada mentions here, in order to establish the Krishna conscious movement more soundly and progressively, our Krishna consciousness movement is genuine, historically authorized, and natural and transcendental during it, due to it being based on Bhagavad Gita as it is. To create a whole society which uh, follow Bhagavad, follows Bhagavad Gita, Prabhupada's explaining that anyone, this is toward the end of the preface, anyone seriously interested in deriving benefit by studying Bhagavad Gita must take help from the Krishna consciousness movement for practical understanding. So Prabhupada labored uh, so much personally, took so, so much sacrifice to provide the books. At late at night when we were all sleeping, Prabhupada was writing his books so that humanity at large could have access to his legacy for generations to come. But uh, the books in themselves uh, also require, as Prabhupada men mentions here, for practical understanding, the direct guidance, one must take hold from the Krishna consciousness movement. So providing a society of, of devotees who follow the teachings of Bhagavad Gita is an aspect of Prabhupada's mission that is revealed in the preface and to teach the whole world. In fact, Prabhupada is very much convinced about the importance of Bhagavad Gita as being uh, the only uh, uh, solution to the world's problems, problems of modern humanity. Prabhupada comments in the middle of page X1X that Krishna consciousness movement is essential to human society. Everyone should have heard Prabhupada is very emphatic here. He's repeating the word three times, everyone. It's a poetic, it's a poetic uh, style to show emphasis. Everyone should know how God or Krishna is great. Everyone should know the factual position of the living entity. Everyone should know the living entity is eternal, a servant, and that unless one serves Krishna, he serves an illusion. Also, Prabhupada's touching on here, Sambandagyan, the relationship that we have with the Lord, the relationship we have with the material nature, the relationship the material nature has with the Lord, and these topics are all elaborately de described in Bhagavad Gita. And to teach, as Prabhupada mentioned, this knowledge constitutes a great science and each and every living and being has to hear it for his own interest. So Prabhupada is very much convinced about the importance of his mission. He's very much convinced and determined about the value of Bhagavad Gita and, and making the knowledge of Bhagavad Gita uh, available to all humanity and Prabhupada has accepted this as his mission in life. As Prabhupada mentions toward the end of the preface, our Krishna consciousness movement is teaching the whole world this central point. And this you could say is like a, a, an essential mission statement of the Krishna consciousness movement. Srila Prabhupada ki. And Prabhupada's mood also in the, in, the, in the preface also is very significant, very, uh, very uh, inspirational. He's very much convinced about the importance of Bhagavad Gita. He's very much determined to spread the teachings of Bhagavad Gita all over the world. He has great compassion and great humility, giving all credit to his spiritual master. And Prabhupada's also very uncompromising and not very much appreciative of the non-devotional commentaries on Bhagavad Gita and warns us very, very uh, carefully that we should be very careful to avoid such non-devotional commentaries. And these are all some important aspects of the preface which we can consider. We won't have a, an elaborate discussion of the introduction, but we will refer to the introduction on specific occasions when some relevant topics appear in later texts. So let us begin our study of Bhagavad Gita as it is, beginning with chapter 1.
text 1. Dhutrasta uvacha dhamakshetre kurkshetre samaveta yuyutsava mamaka pandavashchava kimakurva da shanjaya. Dhritarashtra said, O Sanjaya, after my sons and the sons of Pandu assembled in the place of pilgrimage at Kurukshetra, desiring to fight, what did they do? Prabhupada's discussing the significance of the word Dharmakshetra in his purport. Dharmakshetra means literally the uh, religious field, and it's significant. Prabhupada's commenting that Kurukshetra in itself is a place of religion because traditionally the Kaurava ruling kings would go to Kurukshetra and perform the different types of tapasya and other types of ceremonial sacrifices. So in that way Kurukshetra itself was a holy place. And also it's Dharmakshetra because the Supreme Lord, the, the ultimate authority in Dharma, uh, is appearing at this place on this field in order to establish the ultimate dharma, the param dharma, the sanatan dharma of devotional service. So these very significant opening words of the Bhagavad Gita indicate the significance of the text to come, where Lord Krishna himself personally descends to the earth and he explains all the principles of dharma. And that place is called Dharma Kshetra, Kuru Kshetra. The analogy that Prabhupada gives in the purport is very interesting, just like in the field, one has to uproot all of the unwanted weeds. So similarly, the influence of the holy place of Dharmakshetra will see that the unwanted creepers, the Prabhupada explains the unwanted plants like Dhritarashtra's son and Duryodhan and others would be wiped out. So this is all significant. So the title Dharmakshetra, Kurukshetra. In verses 3 to 11, Different aspects of Duryodhana's diplomacy are revealed. The word diplomacy actually is a Greek word, coming from the Greek word diplos, meaning something with two sides, like we have a diploma, it meant a folded piece of paper with two sides. So dip diplomacy. And we're looking here, uh, the opening verses of the Gita are describing the nature, the, the qualities, the character of Duryodhana, in that he's prepared to say anything in order to get alliance and have his agenda uh, maintained and appreciated by his supporters. And uh, he will say anything in order to ensure their support. So this type of, uh, uh, this type of you could say, manipulative uh, leadership is, is being indicated in the uh, comments that he makes. We'll, we can analyze some of these comments. In text 3, Drupad Putrena Tavashisha Dimataha. He's referring to Drishtadumna in text 3. So rather than referring to Drishtadumya in that name, he's referring to him as Drupad Putra to incite uh, Drona's feelings of animosity toward King Drupad. The history of Mahabharata explains that when Drona and Drupad were together in the Gurukul, they were friends. Even though Drona was the son of a, a very simple Brahmin and Drupad was the son of a king. So at, the, at one time, uh, when they were young, Drupad said to Drona that when I grow up and I, and I inherit the kingdom, I will give you half of the kingdom. So later, uh, after departing from the Gurukul, they went their separate ways. Now, uh, Drona's family members were experiencing some difficulty as a result of his uh, simple lifestyle. And uh, one time, his son Ashvatthama was actually crying for milk, and as they didn't have a cow, Drona was unable to give Ashvatthama milk and the, the village boys, they actually got some rice powder, mixed it with water and then they gave that to Ashvatthama and Ashvatthama was drinking it and saying, oh, it's such nice, it's such nice milk. So seeing this, Drona's heart was so, so much melted with, with uh, empathy for, for the condition of his family members that he, he thought he would go and see King Drupad and simply ask him for a cow. Upon arriving in the palace of King Drupad, Drona was actually insulted by Drupad. He wasn't respected, he wasn't appreciated. Drupad said that uh, friendship only exists among equals, so you, you cannot consider yourself my friend being such an impoverished person. He didn't properly uh, host Drona. Drona was accommodated in the outside barn, and uh, in this way, Drona was very much uh, offended. And uh, his intention was to train up the uh, Kaurava princes, which he did, and the Pandava princes, and have them uh, retaliate when requesting his Dakshina, Guru Dakshina, to bring them the Drupad. 
and uh, uh, Drona actually, uh, he succeeded in this. So and there was great animosity between Drona and Dropad. Eventually, uh, even though the Korova princes were unable to defeat Drupad, when uh, Drona sent Arjuna and the five Pandavas, Arjuna, he defeated Drupad, he tied him up, he brought him before Drona. And this way, uh, Drona uh, punished Drupad, took half the kingdom. But Drupad was still very much uh, upset and uh, he, he wanted to retaliate. He did a yagya. From the yagya of uh, Drupad was born first of all Draupadi, hmm, the wife of the Pandavas, and uh, Drustadumna. And Drustadumna, at the time of performing the yagya, he appeared from the sacrificial fire for the purpose of killing Drona. So here in the verse, uh, uh, Duryodhan, he is, he is inciting the, uh, this previous... Uh, ill feelings that Drona had with Drupad and referring to the general of the Kauravas armies as P Pandava Putra, Pandu Putra, uh, Drupad Putra, and Tava Shishya, your disciple Dimataha, who's very intelligent now as he's standing opposing you on the uh, Pandava army, but you trained him in the military science. So just see what is this ungrateful person. So in this way, he's, he, he's ensuring that Drona will become very much enthusiastic to fight very vehemently against the Pandava soldiers and not be influenced by affection for Arjuna, who was his dearest disciple. Prabhupada actually comments about this nature of Duryodhana, a very liberal nature of a Brahmin, and this is the ideal nature of a Brahmin. Uh, in the purports, Prabhupada gives the example of the sun, which uh, shines everywhere in everyone's courtyard, regardless of whether the person is a sinful person or a pious person. This is a liberal nature of the sun. Similarly, the Brahmin will give transcendental knowledge. That's the duty uh, to any inqui inquiring student, regardless of uh, circumstances that may lead to, which may not be favorable for that uh, Brahmin. But they're not concerned with that. The Brahmin is concerned with giving transcendental knowledge and uh, in this way, Drona is considered an ideal Brahmin. Prabhupada comments, Dronatarya knew that Drupad Maharaj has got his son. In the future, he would kill me. Still, when he was offered to become his disciple to learn military art, he accepted, yes. That means the Brahmanas were so liberal. When he is coming as my disciple, never mind. He would kill me in the future. That doesn't matter, but I must give him, give him teaching. In text 4, here in this army are many great Heroic bowmen, equal in fighting to Bhima and Arjuna. Great fighters like Yuyudan, Virat and Dropad. The Prabhupada's commenting on the names mentioned here. He mentions particularly Bhima and Arjuna because they were such formidable foes. Arjuna was able to go to the heavenly planets and acquire the celestial weapons from Lord Shiva. Pashupati Ashtra. He defeated Lord Shiva in battle. He defeated the, uh, the uh, demons as they were fighting the demigods. He's the son of Indradev and Bhima. Well, Bhima took a very ferocious vow, a very terrific vow, at the time of the disrobing of Draupadi. And uh, he, uh, he's, uh, Drona, uh, Duryodhana is reminding us uh, of the danger of this permit person, Bhima, who had these vows. He, he vowed to break the thighs of Duryodhan, who showed his thighs to Draupadi and said, come and sit here. He vowed to tear off the arms of Dushishan that had touched the sanctified hair of Draupadi. And uh, he vowed to uh, split open the chest of Dushishan and tear out his heart and wash the uh, hair of Draupadi with the blood of Dushishan. And uh, Draupadi actually kept this vow. She didn't tie her hair again until uh, Bhima, Bhima came, having torn open the chest of Dushishan and his hands covered in the blood of Dushishan, and he, he shampooed Draupadi's hair with that. And he also vowed to kill all of the sons of Dhritarashtra. So these very severe vows uh, to break Duryodhana's thighs, to rip off the arms of Dushishan, to split open his chest, pull out his heart, drink his blood, and kill all the sons of Dhritarashtra. And Bhima, at the time of making that vow, he said that, let it be known, I stand here before all the great valiant kings. If I am unable to fulfill these vows, then my ancestors will not be able to attain the uh, ultimate abodes and the, the heavenly realms. So this is a very serious thing, uh, particularly in the uh, previous ages when a Kacharya would, would give a vow 
uh, then maintaining that vow becomes the most important mission in their life, more important than anything else. So these vows that Bhima made were very, very serious. And uh, Duryodhan, he's reminding the uh, soldiers of, of the, uh, the serious combatant they're facing, Bhima. Text number eight, Bhavan Bhishma Shtekarnascha Kripa Cha Shamitim Jaya Ashvatama Vikarnascha Shomadatta Tataiva Cha. Interesting that here Duryodhan first of all refers to Drona. There are personalities like you as Drona. Bhishma Karna Kripa Ashvatama Vikarna, the son of Somadatta, or very victorious in battle. He's particularly uh, mentioning some of the great heroes present there to further inspire them. And it's interesting that uh, although Bhishma is the general of the army and should be shown respect, first of all he mentions Drona because Drona is a Brahmin. So Bhishma of course would understand that the Brahmin should be mentioned first. So you, Bhishma, and then other men, uh, great uh, Maharatis are mentioned, Karna and Kripa, family relatives of Drona. Ashvatama, the son of Drona. Uh, interesting that he mentions Vikarna. Vikarna was one of one of uh, Duryodhana's brothers who was somewhat a little bit uh, doubtful because he protested at the time of Drupadi being disrobed. So he's mentioning him, <laughs> even though he's not considered one of the great Maharatis, but he's mentioning him to uh, some, somewhat flatter him and in that way ensure his his uh, support. Of course, they're, they're, they're in the Vedic uh, fight, there is the opportunity, and, and Yudhisthira actually he called at the beginning of the fight that all you great soldiers present here, who all stand firmly for virtue and righteousness, and, uh, anyone who wants to join our army now, you can come and join. So it was not an uncommon thing in the beginning of these uh, dharmic battles in the Vedic times. There would be exchange of the, the soldiers according to which army they felt was more righteous, the great countries would, would move from one army to the other. And once the battle began, then they would remain with that army. And uh, many uh, uh, we hear many soldiers on the Korriba side uh, being unsatisfied with the leadership of Duryodhana and inspired by the great virtue and religious qualities uh, of the great highly principled leader Yudhisthira. Many of the uh, warriors joined Yudhisthira's army at the beginning of the battle. Of course, we may... We may consider, well, shouldn't we be chanting Hare Krishna and doing sadhana and here we're getting into such political topics. Uh, is this appropriate for Krishna conscious devotees? Well, Prabhupada comments, people may ask, by mentioning these great fighters, what spiritual progress we make? Because we are meant for chanting Hare Krishna, Mahamantra. So by chanting the names of these great fighters, what do we gain? This question may be raised there. But the thing is that Nirvana Krishna Sambande, whenever there is connection with Krishna, that it also becomes Krishna. So these warriors, name mentioning, we should not neglect. Krishna wanted to gather all the demonic and power on the battlefield of Kurukshetra and kill them. That was his plan. So regarding not, not neglecting these uh, early verses of the Bhagavad Gita, you'll find in 1973 in London, Prabhupada, he lectured on the first chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, every verse. And all of these verses you can read full lectures on. And verses 14 to 20 go on to uh, indicate various signs of victory for the Pandavas. There is Madhav, the lord of the goddess of, of fortune, present there on the chariot. Dibya Shankol, when the sounding of the conscious were heard, the sound of Arjuna and Krishna's conscious are described as Dibyam, as transcendental. Char uh, the chariot of Agni, which was given to Arjuna. Uh, Arjuna. Of course, that, that chariot was so special that it was protected, Krishna being, being on that chariot. So many astras, weapons, were let loose by the Kaurava army uh, uh, on the chariot and struck the chariot of Arjuna. But because Krishna was present there, they were unable to, the weapons were unable to damage the chariot. Finally, at the end of the battle, it, it is interesting that Krishna... Uh, told Arjuna to get down off the, the chariot before he stepped off the chariot. Arjuna was off the chariot, and then when Krishna uh, he took his lotus foot uh, from the chariot and, and, and he uh, alighted, then at that moment, boom, the whole chariot just turned into ashes <laughs> as a result of all of the weapons, all of the different curses that had been thrown against the chariot, what, what, which were being held off because of Krishna's lotus feet, which were touching that chariot. So a very special chariot. Kapi Dwaja. On the chariot of Arjuna, 
was the a flag of Hanumanji. And it's very interesting, there, there is a history as to how Hanuman appeared on the chariot, on the flag of Arjuna, Kapidvaja. When the Pandavas were in uh, Badragashram, as they were touring the Himalayas, actually the Pandavas, uh, uh, they re revived the, the uh, temple worship of Badrik, Badri Narayan and uh, Mahadev at Kedranath and Badrinath. Hmm? Those ancient temples there were first built by the, by the Pandavas. So when the Pandavas were in Badrik Ashram, uh, as Alakananda comes pouring down beside the Badri Bishal temple, beautiful Alakananda Ganga, the Himalayan stream, 1,000 petal lotus flower was floating in Alakananda Ganga. And seeing that, Draupadi was enchanted. And uh, she took that flower and she approached Bhima and she said, such a beautiful flower, I would like to offer to Judistia. Uh, can you bring more? And then immediately being inspired by the requests of his wife, as a very dutiful husband would respond, Bhima enthusiastically, he headed up, up to the higher regions of the Himalayas looking for more of the thousand petal lotus. And he was uh, uh, tearing through the jungle and up mountains and throwing boulders away, cracking boulders and pulling uprooting trees as he was very enthusiastic to fulfill this request of Draupadi. Uh, upon the, uh, uh, reaching the higher realms in the Himalayas, he, he saw a huge monkey lying on the path. And he asked that monkey to move aside. And the monkey said, I'm so tired, I'm not moving anywhere, just step over me. Bhima was not so inclined to step over the monkey. Because as uh, Rupa Goswami explains in Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, in the uh, sh Sharana Angasa items of Sarana Bhakti, the Pranamatre, Mano Bhakti, Udveganadiva, Pranamatra, even a very insignificant living entity. Mano Bhakti, not either by our words or by our mind. Udveganadiva, should we act in a way to disturb even a, a, a very insignificant living entity. So he didn't want to disrespect that monkey by jumping over him. He asked the monkey, just move your tail and I'll go around. The monkey said, yeah, I'm too tired. You move my tail. So Bhima, when he trying to move the tail of that monkey, he couldn't move. He's astonished. How is it? I'm the great Bhima, the strength of 10,000 elephants. I can't move the monkey. He recognized that only someone with equal strength to me would be able to perform such a feat. He recognized the monkey must be Hanuman, his brother, as they were both uh, the celestial sons of the wind god Vayu. So recognizing his brother Hanuman, Bhima showed great respect. And at that time Hanuman blessed Bhima that uh, when you are on the battlefield of Kurukshetra and you are uh, killing the uh, sons of uh, Dhritarashtra, actually uh, regarding those vows we mentioned earlier, that uh, the other Pandavas, even when they had opportunity to kill any of Dhritarashtra's sons, hundred sons, they refrained from that so that Bhima would be able to fulfill his vow. And Bhima did, Bhima did fulfill his vow and he did kill a hundred sons of Dhritarashtra. So at that time Hanuman mentioned that when you are uh, tearing open the, the, the chest and, and, and splitting the heads of the sons of Dhritarashtra, drinking their blood, at that time I will roar along with you on the battlefield. And when Bhima would tear, tear apart the bodies of the sons of Dhritarashtra, uh, who are all actually Rakshasas incarnated, and he would tear their limbs off and then drink their blood, standing on the battlefield, uh, the great warrior, uh, and this struck so much terror, and he would roar, and, and the, the, the core of the warriors would see this, this ferocious warrior, as he's tearing up the, 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 the bodies of the, the great generals, drinking their blood, roaring, even it, it terrified the, the warriors on the Pandu army, what to speak of the Korriba army. And Hanuman mentioned also that I will also uh, uh, reside on the flag of Arjuna's chariot, and in this way, my, my presence, you will have my association. And Prabhupada's commenting about the nature of a Vaishnava is to take shelter of the previous Acharyas. So in the fighting principle, Arjuna is fighting for Krishna. He is following the previous fighting Acharya Hanumanji. Therefore, he has depicted his flag with Hanuman. That Hanumanji, Bajranga Ji, kindly help me. This is Vaishnavism. I have come here to fight for Lord Krishna. And you fought, you fought also for the Lord. Kindly help me. That, that is the idea. Kapi Dodge. So any activities of the Vaishnava, they should always pray to the previous Acharya. Kindly help me. Kindly, this is Vaishnava. Vaishnava is always thinking himself helpless and begging help from the previous Acharya. The topic under discussion here is 
the band of Kurukshetra. We'll see the discussion between Arjuna and Krishna based around the issue of fighting. And the topic has many angles which need to be clearly understood. How is it possible, the issue here that, that we're going to be looking at over the next few lessons is how is it possible that uh, Lord Krishna, who is all loving and full of mercy, is actually so determined to induce Arjuna to fight in the battle? And how is it that the Vaishnava should actually be involved in these political intrigues? Uh, this seems to be some, somewhat of a compromise from the, the spiritual standards, where one should be detached from politics, etc. So this has to be understood very clearly, and this is a very central theme of the Bhagavad Gita, which we'll be examining over the next few lessons. Prabhupada's commenting, there are two missions, not only to give protection to the devotees, but also to kill the demons. So the devotees of Krishna should be trained up both ways, not only to give protection to the devotees, to give them encouragement, but if need be, they should be prepared to kill the demons. This is Vaishnavism. Taken on face value, one may misunderstand Prabhupada's comment here and think this is some type of legitimization of militaristic activities amongst the followers of Srila Prabhupada. Uh, and uh, this is not exactly uh, how we should understand the statement here. Uh, basically because uh, in, in, in addition to the principles of spiritual life and our term Sanat and Dharma, we also need to follow Sanat and Dharma in consideration of the Loka Vichar, or the considerations of the social environment, the legal environment, the circumstances that we find ourselves in, and this can't be completely ignored. Rupa Goswami also explains in the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu that one should deal with the material world as much as necessary, not overly absorb oneself in the material world, and not be overly neg negligent also. So because, and particularly in these modern times, uh, if we were to function in this way and engage in militaristic activity, then that would be detrimental for the spreading of Krishna consciousness movement as it would cause a lot of trouble uh, legally for our movement and perhaps we could be prevented in many cases being somewhat of an extremist type of a movement uh, and uh, that would be unfavorable for spreading Krishna consciousness. So this is not an activity that we are particularly promoting the devotees should be prepared and training themselves to kill the demons. Rather, uh, we spread Krishna consciousness in a very uh, compassionate way and uh, we don't engage in political or other type of uh, violent activities. However, in principle, um, the devotee is prepared to do anything that Krishna wants. And we'll see that because Krishna desired the battle, and we'll see how is it that Krishna desired the battle, because ultimately it's beneficial for everyone involved. And in that way, uh, the devotee is prepared to do whatever Krishna wants. Prabhupada continues. Generally, a Vaishnava is non-violent. Just like Arjuna. In the beginning, he was non-violent. He said, Krishna, what is the use of this fighting? Let them enjoy. So by nature, he was non-violent. But he was induced by Krishna to become violent. Your non-violence will not help. Your, you become violent. I kill them. You, you become violent. You kill them. I want it. So if Krishna wants... We shall be prepared to become violent. This is a principle. We'll do whatever Krishna wants, and we know that that is the highest principle of religion. So those who are devotees of Krishna, they should be trained up both ways. They should be prepared, but generally there's no question of becoming violent unnecessarily. Of course, if the devotees are attacked, if the uh, temple is attacked, if they're uh, in that way uh, a great uh, threat, then naturally the devotee must take all means to protect the devotees and protect the uh, interest of the Lord. And if that requires violence to do that, then uh, the devotee shouldn't be averse to doing that. In texts 21 and 22, we see Lord Sri Krishna first appearing in the Bhagavad Gita. And it's very interesting, the uh, moment that Krishna appears, he is serving his devotee. Arjuna Uvacha, Shenayo Ubayo Madye, Radam Shtapayame Juta, Yavade Tan, Nirik Sheham, Jutakamam Avashtitan. Arjuna is, he's actually ordering Krishna. Arjuna Uvacha, Shenayo Ubayo Madye, between the two armies, Radam Shtapayame Juta, Hey Juta, you place the chariot between the two armies so I can see all of those who have assembled here. 
Prabhupada's commenting in a purport the significance of this incident, where the devotee, who is the insignificant subordinate of the Lord, uh, he's actually ordering the Lord. Now, how is it possible? This is possible because Arjuna's relationship is a special type of relationship. It's called prema bhakti, and particularly in this type of uh, of relationship with Krishna, uh, one is not so much concerned about the. Uh, formal position of Krishna and his opulence as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Arjuna is relating to Krishna directly as a friend. And later in the fourth chapter, Krishna himself, he acknowledges Arjuna's position as his friend. Because you're my devotee, Shaka, and my friend, you can understand the transcendental mystery of this science. Prabhupada's commenting in the purport. The relationship between the Lord and His servitor is very sweet and transcendental. The servitor is always ready to render service to the Lord, and similarly the Lord is always seeking an opportunity to render some service to His devotee. He takes greater pleasure in His pure devotee assuming the advantageous position of ordering Him than He does in being the giver of orders. Prabhupada told a story in this connection about Prime Minister Gladstone, who was the Prime Minister of England when Prabhupada was a, a young youth. Uh, before Churchill, before the Second World War. Prabhupada wasn't a young youth, he was a young man. <laughs> Prime Minister Gladstone, the Prime Minister of England uh, prior to Churchill, when Prabhupada was a young man. So Prabhupada heard this story about the Prime Minister of England, <coughs> that uh, the ambassador from Germany had come and was waiting outside his office. And the secretary mentioned German ambassador has come. It was a very important meeting, actually, there on the brink of a world war. And uh, Gladstone was saying, yeah, okay, just, just wait, just wait. So the ambassador is sitting and he's waiting and looking at his clock, looking at his watch, and sitting and waiting, waiting a long time, 40 minutes, one hour, one and a half hours. Eventually he kept saying to the secretary, how long? And the secretary was saying, well, just now coming in. He couldn't wait any longer. And he went and he, he opened the door of the Prime Minister's office and he saw Prime Minister Gladstone down on his hands and knees on the floor of his office, imitating a horse. And sitting on his back was his grandson, who had a, a, a stick in his hand, and he was, he was smacking the Prime Minister on the rear, rear end, uh, saying, Giddy up, giddy up! And the Prime Minister in this day was, was enjoying playing as a horse with his grandson. So this is very relishable, because all of the official work, and the, the, the policies, and the diplomacy, etc., is quite a headache. And when he gets a chance to forget all that and just play, uh, he actually enjoys that more. Prabhupada is using this example to describe to us the nature of Lord Sri Krishna, that Machtani Sharava Bhutani, even though the entire world is resting in him and he's completely in control of everything, na chaham teshu abashtitaha. He's actually not in the material world. He's not so much involved in the material world. Krishna is completely absorbed in reciprocating as Braja Bihari enjoying in Vrindavan with his devotees. And uh, this relationship between Arjuna and Krishna is such a relationship. Gaurava Shakya Prema. It's interesting that later, when Arjuna saw the universal form of Krishna, here Arjuna is considering Krishna like his friend. Later, when Krishna displays the universal form to Arjuna in the 11th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, uh, the, then Arjuna at that time, he's commenting there that he regretted the intimate behavior, we sat on the same bed together, we ate together, we spoke like equals, sometimes I boasted in front of you, oh please forgive me, F forgetting your opulence, I uh, behaved with you in such an intimate way. Hmm? But actually Krishna uh, uh, likes this type of relationship. Of course, Arjuna's unique position is that he fluctuates, sometimes understanding the opulence of the Lord as the supreme controller, and sometimes forgetting that, and just dealing with the Lord as a friend. And you can see different occasions where a different mood will be there. Prabhupada uh, explains in his purports to the Chaitanya Charitamrita, Madhya Leela, chapter 19, where Mahabrabhu is in, instructing Rupa Goswami in the Rasa Tattva. Mahabrabhu gives this example of Arjuna, comparing it to Vrindavan, the uh, love of the residents of Vrindavan, that even though Krishna displays his opulence, their intimacy is never uh, interrupted. Mm. Kevala Shuddha Prem, Arshajana Janle, Arshajadekleo, 
nija shambandha shemane. Aishraja deklio, in the case of Krishna demonstrating his opulence to Maya Jasoda and, and showing the universal form within his mouth, uh, momentarily Maya Jasoda is thinking philosophical, uh, uh, some thoughts philosophically, and then she immediately, the snap out of a woman. You, you're here with your baby, is your son, uh, you have to feed him, you have to dress him. Uh, these, even though Krishna shows his opulence, the Brajabhasis, they never consider him God because there's so much uh, merged in their love for Krishna as the Gopal, the cowherd boy, Nanda Dulal. Iti drik salila be ananda kunde, swago sham nima jantam akya payantam. Tadi eshita geshu, bhakti echita tom. The tadi eshita, those who are worshipping the Lord, understanding his opulence, bhakti echita tom. In this Dhammada Lila, we are seeing that Krishna is actually conquered by love and affection rather than reverence. And these interesting points are introduced very early in the study of Bhagavad Gita. In our first session today, we were discussing the situation on the battlefield of Kurukshetra, Duryodhana's diplomacy, and the signs of victory for the Pandavas. And we also discussed uh, some very significant comments Srila Prabhupada makes in his preface to Bhagavad Gita as it is, which revealed his broad mission for spreading Krishna consciousness all over the world and the uh, role that Bhagavad Gita as it is plays in the fulfillment of Srila Prabhupada's mission. In our next session, we'll be concluding the first chapter and we look forward to seeing you then. Thank you, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai, Hare Krishna. And we can conclude with this comment from, from Prabhupada. If one adopts the principles enunciated in Bhagavad Gita, he can make his life perfect and make a permanent solution to all the problems of life. This is the sum and substance of the entire Bhagavad Gita. Shri Prabhupada Ki.